Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. Episode 11. I'm Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. Not everyone is yet convinced of the use of blockchain and DLT, and recent attempts to digitize trade and trade finance have been pretty unsuccessful. Consortia networks have become a common method for businesses to collaborate on the use of blockchain and DLT, but there are many challenges ahead. Internal processes have become increasingly digital, but transactions involving multiple parties are still costly complex and largely paper-based. This lack of success to date has been mainly due to limitations of legacy technology systems, platforms and networks that supported these digitization efforts. Trade Finance Global and TradeIX today have published a white paper, The Global State of the Market for Blockchain and DLT Within Trade Finance and Shipping. We're hearing from Dave Sutter, Chief Strategy Officer at TradeIX. So without further ado, here's Dave, joining us live from London. Hi Dave, thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast. Hello everybody, this is Dave Sutter here, Chief Strategy Officer of TradeIX. Um, I've spent almost seven years now at the intersection of distributed ledger technology, also known as blockchain, and global trade, transaction banking, supply chains and trade finance. And I'm here to talk to you today about the evolution I've seen in the market scene and the technology that is underpinning those markets and the participants therein. We see how even in 2019, trade is so paper-based and reliant on such legacy software. Can global trade really become digital and connected? This is the opening question of the article. And, And the reason we ask it is because after decades and decades of effort, significant time and money being invested in making global trade a much more digital and connected activity, by any stretch of the imagination, we've been unsuccessful. So trade, finance, and global trade is one of the most important and socioeconomically and macroeconomically important sectors of financial services. Almost 80% of all global trade involves some form of trade finance or credit insurance. And despite that fact, we still have a very manual, inefficient, disconnected ecosystem that's still dependent almost entirely on paper. And the question is, after so much time and effort, is it possible to make global trade connected and digital? The answer, fortunately, is yes. But as we'll discuss over the remainder of this presentation, as we elaborate on in greater detail in the article, is that there are three key requirements for any technology platform or network that's supporting digitization and connectivity efforts within global trade and trade finance. And any technology platform or network hoping to have a shot at creating a global uh, trade ecosystem that is digital and connected needs to meet all three of these requirements simultaneously. The first requirement is to support seamless and secure multi-party trade transactions across independent software systems, platforms, and networks. So allowing the seamless and peer-to-peer as well as real-time exchange of trade data and assets between all the various systems that we depend on to facilitate the flow of goods, the flow of money, and the flow of credit in support of trade. The second requirement is that we provide solutions that give users the right, not the obligation, to manage, control, and secure their own data in any way they see fit. And moreover, to deploy these technology systems under any configuration that they have a requirement for, be that a regulatory requirement and or an organizational requirement. And the last key requirement for technology that can and will digitize and connect global trade is that that technology enables users to connect once, to connect to many. And by that, we mean this technology infrastructure should require only a single integration and a single interface that once performed 
And once connected to, gives you seamless access to everyone else on the network. So something analogous to connect once to connect to many would be email. So once you have an email address and a single email client, you can communicate with anyone else in the world that has an email domain name without requiring an integration. So you connect to email once and you've been now connected to everyone else with an email address. And so that same concept, we also need to apply to global trade technology and trade networks. And while legacy paradigms, uh, which we'll discuss here moving forward, have been able to meet one, maybe even two of these requirements, they've never been able to meet all three requirements simultaneously. And we'll discuss how new technologies, specifically distributed trade networks and platforms, are able to meet all three requirements simultaneously. And as such, can actually digitize and connect the global trade ecosystem in a way that we've been working towards for for several decades now. What do you consider a trade platform and or network? Yeah, this is a really good question for the purposes of our discussion here. The word trade platform or trade network is a pretty generic term. And in this case, what we mean by trade platform and or network is any software system any platform, any network or application, or really any other derivative that uses software and technology to facilitate the flow of goods, the flow of money, of data, and of credit in support of cross-border commerce and global trade. So some examples that we can think of that we'd consider for purposes of this discussion as a trade platform or network are core banking systems, uh, third-party trade finance platforms, corporate ERPs and accounting software, e-procurement and e-invoicing networks, inventory management and warehouse management systems, logistics management systems, collateral registries. In short, any and all of the digital systems, trading parties, banks, buyers, sellers, logistics companies, insurers, and others use to conduct global trade is what we would consider for purposes of this discussion, a trade platform or a trade network. What do you qualify as a truly digital trade or connected ecosystem? So when we say a truly digital and connected global trade ecosystem, this is really an I'll know it when I see it moment, which is that when global trade really is digital and connected, there won't be a question whether or not it is digital or connected. So we're sort of still so far away from it. It's obvious that we're not. But if we want to provide more specificity to this definition and qualify it, it would be an ecosystem in which the majority of global trade transactions occur entirely digitally, are facilitated and financed using a standard and open technology infrastructure that connects the majority of participants involved in the conduct and financing of global trade. And last but not least, one that enables all trading parties to transact and exchange trade data and exchange trade assets as seamlessly as they would exchange text messages or emails. So a leap analogous to the one that we're describing here would be to do for global trade what the internet did for information, where as before, a vast majority of mail communication was entirely paper-based, used the post office, used the national post. And now a majority of business-to-business communication is, is via email. We can look at sort of examples where the dynamic would be the same in global trade, where today only 10% of invoices sent each year are electronic. So at about 170 million or billion, 170 billion invoices sent globally last year, only 10% were electronic. In a digital and connected trade ecosystem, we would see that number flip on its head. So only 10% of invoices would be paper-based. The other 90% would be sent electronically and via a standard infrastructure in the same way that paper mail is now sent electronically by a standard infrastructure that we call email or electronic mail. So this is the type of uh, leap that we're looking for when we define a truly global and connected trade ecosystem. Why is global scale and mass adoption such a hard requirement in the global ecosystem that we see in the world of trade? So when you read the article, what you'll see is that All three requirements are requirements that enable global scale and mass adoption. And the failure to meet one, two, or all three requirements and meet all three requirements simultaneously prevents global scale and mass adoption. 
And so the question is, if these requirements are what's possible to achieve global scale and mass adoption, then why is global scale and mass adoption so important? So why are we saying these requirements must be met to connect and uh, digitize trade, and they must be met in order to achieve scale and adoption? The reason global scale and mass adoption and the ability to drive global scale and mass adoption by any technology solution hoping to digitize and connect trade is because global trade is an entirely networked activity. And any technology solution that wants to become pervasive and thus digitize and connect it needs to depend on network effects. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of network effects, this describes an economic and technical phenomenon whereby the value of a product or service increases as the number of other users using it increases. A good example of this in action is the telephone. So if I'm the only person in the world with a telephone and everyone else is using carrier pigeons to communicate, even though my telephone is definitely going to be more secure and more cost efficient and much faster than carrier pigeons, my phone at that point is useless to me. Why? Because there's no one else on the planet that has a telephone. But as more and more people start buying telephones and more and more businesses start buying telephones, the value of my phone goes up because I can actually now use it to communicate with a certain percentage of the people and businesses I need to communicate with. When I do and I use the phone, it's much more secure, it's much more efficient, and it's much faster. And at a certain point, what will happen is that network, the telephone network, will reach a critical mass which is a certain percentage or level of adoption that makes the value obtained from that network greater than or equal to the price of connecting and using that network. So going back to our phone example, if 10% of my businesses and people that I need to communicate now use a phone, it's going to be worth it for me to buy that phone because I'll spend a certain amount on the phone, a certain amount on the network, but I'll save much more by reducing my uses of carrier pigeons by 10%. And so this exact same dynamic of network effects and the exponentially increasing level of value leading to an exponentially increasing rate of adoption, in turn driving an even greater level of value and so on and so forth, creates a positive feedback loop. And any type of digital solution, especially in global trade, needs to embrace and enable network effects. And as I said earlier, the three key requirements that we talk about in this paper, and we'll talk about later in this podcast, is that these are all requirements for enabling network effects. And network effects are dependent on global scale and mass adoption. So this is something that you'll see us come back to quite a bit. Drawing this analogy to a trade-specific solution, right now, a majority of the people on the planet still depend on paper invoices. and if you're the only person in the world with an e-invoicing network, despite e-invoicing being much faster, much more secure, and much more efficient than paper invoices, their value is quite limited because the adoption is so low that you still need to rely on paper. And because your e-invoicing network can only communicate with a small number of counterparties that you trade with, its value is very limited. But if 95% of the people on the planet still use that same e-invoicing network, then that e-invoicing network would be the new paper invoice. There would be no question about whether or not you use that e-invoicing network. It'd be probably one of the first things you do when you open up a business, just in the same way that the first thing you do is get a phone number and an email address. So these same dynamics are really important for any technology solution helping, hoping to digitize and connect trade to play off of. And, and the requirements that those technologies must meet in order to drive network effects are all dependent on global scale and mass adoption. So how do you see the evolution of different networks, consortia, and platforms? Until now, we've experienced three big paradigms of technology that we've used to support our efforts to digitize and connect global trade. The first paradigm which was really the only paradigm up until the early 2000s was on-premise software and on-premise software instances. The second paradigm, which came about in the early 2000s and really is still a dominant paradigm today, are destination networks and platforms, which we'll explain what that means here shortly. 
And the third paradigm, the new paradigm, which we're discussing here today and will posit is the only paradigm that can meet all three of these requirements simultaneously is distributed platforms and networks. So the first paradigm, on-premise software. Uh, on-premise software is a single software instance that's hosted in the data center or data centers of the user itself. So the user is given software that's either deployed or developed by a third party or developed proprietary in-house. And that user is responsible for managing that instance of the software system in its own data center on its own dedicated servers. These on-premise software systems have made internal processes faster, more digital, and more efficient. The issue is when it comes time to move data and support transactions that cross outside of that on-premise software system's walled garden, they inject a tremendous amount of cost, a tremendous amount of risk and friction into transactions that are outside of that on-prem system's walled garden. And that's because each on-prem software instance is really a total digital island, or in other words, a data silo. That means that each individual instance has no way, no easy way of seamlessly exchanging data and assets with the other software systems and the other trading parties that are using those software systems. If you do want to connect these independent digital islands or data silos, you're going to need to undertake very slow, very costly, and entirely bespoke integration efforts for each new connection and for each new trading party that you want to exchange data and transact with. And this means for n number of participants that you need to transact with, you need to undergo n number of these very slow, costly, and bespoke integrations, which is a huge barrier, an undertaking that cannot be underestimated, and just how difficult and how slow and how costly just one connection can be between two on-prem software systems. Even worse, even if you're able to get these systems to communicate with one another, the parties that are connected are unable to maintain an established trust in a single source of truth across them. The messaging systems that these on-prem software systems utilize are really just sending messages that are a reflection of the past. And there's no guarantee that the software systems involved in that connection or in that network are looking at the same source of truth, have the same view of the world. And as such, there's no way to ensure that all data across all these systems is in sync. And the inability to do this creates a ton of cost and a ton of risk in the form of manual reconciliation and third-party audits. And in many instances, the lack of this capability is what makes fraud possible. So when we look at the three requirements as applied to on-premise software, we see the first requirement, the ability to support seamless and secure multi-party trade transactions across different systems, across different platforms and networks. The first paradigm certainly does not meet. It's pretty much the opposite of seamless and secure. The second requirement, it does meet, which is that On-prem software systems do provide users the ability to manage and control and secure their own data. They do that inherently because each user is managing and hosting this application on their own servers, in their own data centers behind their firewall. So they physically control that data and they physically control the hardware on that data. The importance of that requirement, of the second requirement, as we'll see later on, is really the primary reason why on-prem software is still used today, despite how inefficient and costly it is. It's because it does still meet that second requirement. And when we look at the next paradigm, you'll see that it makes the first requirement easier, but eliminates the second. And so the last requirement for on-prem software, the ability to connect once to connect to many is definitely not met by on-prem software. This is every new connection, every new trading party, Every new technology system that you want to move data from your system to theirs is completely bespoke, completely new integration that must be undertaken every time. So what about on-premise software? What's a destination platform and why can't trade just use one centralized software system? Uh, When we talk about on-premise software and a lot of the issues that on-premise software has when it comes to multi-party trade transactions, moving data between multiple systems and how hard that is with on-premise software. In the early 2000s, a new paradigm emerged that was designed to address the shortcomings of the first paradigm. And that new paradigm is 
called a destination platform or a destination network. And they attempted to digitize and streamline multi-party trade transactions by bringing all parties onto a single centralized destination that's managed by a single third-party vendor. And these destinations require all users' trade data to be stored in a single centralized database and use a single software system that's owned and operated by a single third-party vendor. And because of this, they're almost always provided software as a service. And because users read and write from the same database, and they use a single software system that provides a standard digital way of encoding rules and business logic and workflow into trade transactions, this theoretically makes multi-party transactions much more digital, much faster, and more efficient than they were with on-premise software systems. And moreover, because everyone uses the same database, we do have an assurance that at least within that destination platform, that everyone's looking at the same source of truth and that the errors and inconsistencies and fraud that's possible in disconnected databases, as is the case in on-prem software, is mitigated to an extent. The issue is, one, the logical conclusion of a destination platform and the basis for its value applies only to transactions between trading parties who are on the same destination platform. So the value that's derived from reading and writing from the same database and using the same software system to process transactions is completely done away with when you start to try to move data between different destination platforms. So when you have trading parties who are using different destination platforms, moving data between them and supporting secure multi-party trade transactions is just as hard as it would be with on-premise software. And that's because each new connection between each new destination platform requires the same slow, costly, and bespoke integration and has no way of ensuring that the databases across different destination platforms are in sync. And this is a fatal flaw because the logical outcome of a destination platform and its ability to actually digitize and connect trade would require all trading parties across the world to store all of their trade data in a single database that's owned by a single third party. And there are thousands of different destination platforms on the market today. And so we see that this is just not possible. And the reason it's not possible, and the reason there's been no one platform to rule them all, if you will, is because destination platforms and networks can't meet all three of these key requirements. The first requirement, supporting seamless and secure multi-party trade transactions across independent systems, It does not meet. It meets for trading parties who are using the same destination platform, but it does not meet that requirement for moving data across different destination platforms. Meaning, unless, as we said, everyone comes to the same destination and uses a single database and a single software system, this requirement can't and won't be met by destination platforms. The second requirement is... One of the reasons and destination platforms failure to meet the second requirement is one of the primary reasons why the logical outcome of a destination platform can never be met. And that's because it fails to provide users the right, not the obligation, to manage and control and secure their own data. And that's because the value of a destination platform is that everyone uses the same database and that database is maintained and controlled by a third party. So there's no possible way for a destination platform to meet all the data custody, data residency, and data privacy requirements that you'd see in a global supply chain, which could have hundreds of thousands of participants. And that's just one global supply chain. So in order to meet the requirements of millions of different participants in global trade, each participant needs to have the ability to manage and secure the data in any way they see fit so that they can meet both regulatory, data custody, residency, and privacy requirements, as well as organizational requirements. And destination platforms just can't do this because of the way they're built. And it's unfortunate, but the way that they're built is how they derive their value. So these destination platforms, you see, run into really hard limits when they go to scale because they can't meet these first two requirements. The third requirement, again, is the ability to connect once to connect to many. Destination platforms can meet that for trading parties on the same destination trading platform or network. If I connect to one destination once, I'm theoretically connected to all other trading parties on that same platform. Again, the issue is there are thousands of these destination platforms 
And we already know and have established that there can never be one to rule them all. And so really, you don't have Connect Once to connect to many because there is no way to connect to one destination platform, but then also be seamlessly connected to everyone else on every other destination platform. So in reality, you run into the same exact issues you do with on-premise software. Almost each new connection that you need to make requires a very bespoke and costly and time-consuming integration effort. So tell us about distributed platforms and networks. What are they and what can they do? Distributed platforms and distributed trade networks are powered by distributed ledger technology and blockchain and enable independent software systems, independent software platforms and networks to exchange data and exchange trade assets and perform multi-party trade transactions in an entirely automated fashion over an open and distributed network. And so in the distributed platform and network paradigm, we have any number of independently owned and operated software systems who are exchanging data, exchanging documents, exchanging assets, and transacting very seamlessly, very securely, peer-to-peer and in real time. And more importantly, they do that with two things. One, with provenance, and two, with consensus. So provenance is a mathematically provable certainty regarding ownership and the history of data and or assets. So not only do you have all these independent software systems communicating with one another, regardless of how they're hosted or who built them or where they're maintained, but you have a mathematically provable certainty over ownership of the data and the audit trail of the data as it moves between all those different trading parties and all those different software systems. So you get much more transparency, much more visibility, much more trust in data as it moves across these different software systems. The next is you get consensus, which describes cryptographic certainty that all data is always in sync. Said easier, mathematical certainty that I know what I see is what you see. And this is something that these two things, provenance and consensus, are something that the first two paradigms haven't even come close to being able to provide. But in distributed platforms and networks, we have secure and seamless multi-party trade transactions with both provenance of data and consensus that all data across all these different independent software systems and databases, regardless of where they're owned, who owns them, where they're operated, where they're managed, who developed them, we know that they're always going to be in sync. We have complete visibility into the history of data as it's moved between these different systems. And what this does is not only does it make it much easier to move data between all the different trade platforms and networks, but it also gives all the trading parties visibility and trust into a single source of truth, as well as provides them a standard and shared language for encoding rules, business logic, and workflow that we also call smart contracts is something that you may have heard. But really what you get is the two valuable things about destination platforms and networks is you know looking at the same database and using the same language for business logic rules and workflow, the downsides of that destination platform are data custody, the inability to move data between multiple destination platforms, and their failure to do global connect once to connect to many. What distributed platforms and networks do is give you all the benefits of destination platforms and networks with none of the drawbacks. So each participant is able to maintain custody and control of their own data meaning that they're able to meet the second requirement, which is enable users to manage, control, and secure their own data and support all types of deployment configurations. They meet the first requirement, which is the ability to support seamless and secure multi-party trade transactions across independent software systems, platforms, and networks, meaning we don't have the requirement of one platform to rule them all like we do with destination platforms and networks. And last but not least, they enable users to connect once to connect to many. Once you've performed a single integration to that distributed network, you're able to seamlessly communicate and transact with anyone else on that network, regardless of which software system they're using, regardless of where their data is being hosted or how it's being managed. And this is a very, very powerful capability. Very interesting, Dave. Thank you. So now, final question for today, which trade paradigm or network in your thoughts will prevail in the future? One of the primary purposes of this article was really to answer that question. More importantly, which platform or network could possibly achieve our goal of a truly digital and truly connected global trade ecosystem? 
It's too early to say with certainty that distributed trade networks and platforms will in fact lead to a ubiquitously digital and ubiquitously connected global trade ecosystem. Strong network effects are required and superior technology does not guarantee them. There are also factors at play unrelated to technology, including but not limited to legal and regulatory considerations, tensions that are created by job preservation bias, the difficulty of aligning incentives between all the key stakeholders in all the different industries around the world. And last but not least, entrenched cultural and institutional habits and comforts that have been built up over hundreds of years. And these factors cannot be ignored. And they do need addressed in lockstep with any and all digitization and connectivity efforts. What we can say with complete certainty, backed by decades of empirical evidence and decades of watching this play out, is that the first two paradigms cannot digitize and connect global trade. They do not and cannot meet all three key requirements simultaneously. While on the other hand, distributed trade networks and platforms can meet all three requirements simultaneously and as such have the best shot, the only shot of creating a global trade ecosystem that's digital and connected. So if we really do believe that a global trade ecosystem that is digital and connected and a ubiquitous manner that has all the scale and all the mass adoption that we need to drive network effects, then we need to understand that those first two paradigms and trying to use technology to do that is just not going to be possible. We're going to end up exactly where we've ended up today, which is a global trade ecosystem that's still highly dependent on paper that uses technology that's extremely disconnected and leads to a lot of cost and a lot of risk and a lot of friction in the way that we conduct and finance trade. And that third paradigm, distributed trade platforms and networks, by meeting all three requirements simultaneously, provides us the basis for a real effort that has a shot of being successful to digitize and connect global trade. Thank you very much for joining us on Trade Finance Talks. And we really look forward to hearing you at Consortia 2019 later on today. For our listeners, please make sure you check out our map of the Consortia who's who in the network, and you can download our free guides, infographics, and much more on tradefinanceglobal.com forward slash blockchain. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.